a subject which is not very often taught, with, but which is a very important subject if we're going to learn how to walk with God and relate with Him. And that is the subject of meditation. Okay, the subject of um, meditation. And so today we're going to study, it's a very important aspect of walking with the Lord, learning the, the art of meditation. Okay, learning to wait on God in meditation is a secret the real secret of moving on to higher levels or planes of relationship with him. And it's a key, it's a very important key to um, moving into that and, and another level of relationship with him, meditation, contemplation, will take you into God's realm where the, you, you will begin to ascend into God and leaves behind the mundane Christianity and seats you with God in heavenly places. And so we're going to really look at this and... Um, there's a lot in the Bible about uh, meditation. When God first spoke to Joshua, when he took over from Moses, he said in Joshua 1.8, he said, The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate in a day and night. And observe to do what is written thereof. If He said, If you do this, I'll make your way prosperous, and you will have uh, good success. So be strong and be of good courage. But the key words were, the book of the Lord shall not depart out of your mouth. You will meditate in it day and night. Again, we have it kind of reiterated again in, in the book of Psalms and in the Psalm 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, the wisdom of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in, sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in God's word. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Then, he said, if you will do this, you will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth your fruit in its season. Your leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever you do shall prosper. And so, but that was predicated upon the fact, if you delight in the law of the Lord, meditate in it day and night. And there are many other scriptures, but those will suffice us today. And um, they are important in the area of we have to learn this whole area of meditation. And so we're going to look at it today. In Psalm 46 and verse 10, it says, Be still and know. Be still and know. Be still and know that I am God. And uh, the word there, know, is the, is the Hebrew word yada, which means to ascertain by seeing by experiencing, by becoming a part of, to knowing which you actually experience or become a part of. And so, you know, we live our lives in great turmoil and busyness, which, you know, causes us to live in a constant state of tension. Quite often we, we're so used to that, we're not aware of it anymore. We just live in that tension, you know, in, in, in the kind of world we live in. But the problem is this isolates us from God and keeps us imprisoned in the temporal, locking us out of the, the realms of God. And so, you know, we have to do something about that. So David said in Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. You know, he said later in Psalm 103, 34, my meditation of the Lord shall be sweet. And uh, then later he said a remarkable thing in Psalm 119, 99, he said, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Why? For, because he said, your word is my meditation. Okay, he said, you, I have more understanding than all of my teachers. The reason for that is, was he to learn to meditate. Now, I guess, you know, David spent long hours, particularly when he was a shepherd on the hillside, a kind of lonely lifestyle, but he was alone. It was quiet, and particularly at night. And uh, when the sheep were either sleeping or, or you know, in a quiet time, and, and, and he learned to meditate. So we're going to look at this because certain conditions need to be in place if we're going to enter into this realm of meditation. Now, what I'm going to tell you today is that this learning to meditate is, is going to require time. You know, we have very little time. For God as it is. 
This is a key to taking you further into the realms of God. And if you can learn how to meditate and how to uh, meditate on the things of God, it is going to take you into a realm of God that you've not experienced before. And certain conditions need to be in place if we're going to come into this state of meditation. Because becoming still is very difficult. How many of you know that? It is very, very difficult to become still. And it requires some discipline of our, on our part. You know, Jesus recognized this. He said in Mark 6 and verse 31, he said to the disciples, he said, Come apart into a desert place and rest for a while. It's for there were many comings and goings, and they had no leisure, time so much as to eat. And quite often, Jesus would go aside, particularly at night, and he'd climb up into a mountain somewhere, or he'd go into the wilderness, and there be alone um, with God. Now, let me ask you a question. When is the last time that you were alone for two or three hours with God? In other words, <laughs> you see, I mean, really alone, no interruptions, no other people, you know, and you're in the presence of God in meditation. See, now we kind of need to understand this. Jesus recognized this was a problem. Paul recognized this. He said, look, he said, there remains a rest for you people of God. These were Pentecostal people he was writing to, but he said, you haven't come into rest. There remains a rest for you. He said then, he said, let us labor or strive to enter into that rest. It's very difficult to enter into rest. You got He said you've got to labor to enter into it. Okay, very quickly today, the definition, meditation, its definition, both in the Greek and the Hebrew, the meanings are similar. And it means to muse, to think, to murmur, and not murmuring against people, but talking things over with yourself, um, to imagine. And then come all of those words, you know, to, to muse, to meditate, to muse on, to think, to murmur. Talk to yourself about that is to imagine. Now, in order to come into meditation, meditation requires stillness. You've got to become still. And this is necessary on two fronts. One, we have to quiet an outside noise, and you have to quiet an inside noise. Okay? Sometimes the inside noise is louder than the outside noise. And, uh, you know, the outside noise is quite simple. You've got to eliminate all external distractions, like phones, you know, children, anything that's going to distract you. And that requires some dis- discipline, and it requires some organizing, okay? Because um, if you get into a state of meditation, n- n- noise or distraction will pull you out of it very quickly, and it's hard to get back in. Now, so you have to kind of set up your environment to such a way where you are not going to be disturbed, all right? Now, that's the outside noise. The inside noise is difficult again. Some people are very, very noisy on the inside, you know, and sometimes you can hear that. Uh, you can hear the inside noise in some people. It's like, you know, it's like your thoughts have a life of their own. You can't stop them, you know, and uh, becoming still can be difficult. You've got to learn to quiet in your inner being, you know, the voices, the thoughts within that demand your attention all the time. Now, there has to be, they have to be quietened. That is very difficult. Because the minute, minute you get down to be quiet before the Lord, your mind will begin to play back to you all the things you should have done, you did, things that people said to you during the day, things that you have to do tomorrow, and so it goes, and it's like it has a mind of its own, it's totally independent of you, and it's difficult to stop it. Okay? We'll come to that in a moment. You have to also control your spiritual environment. And what I mean by that is, it's, don't get into conflict with the devil. He'll try and bring you into conflict. It's not a time to deal with the devil in conflict or anything like that. He's very shrewd, 
Don't get into conflict with the devil. Uh, this is not a time for warfare. It's a time for waiting and meditating. And so, you know, if he comes up with thoughts of condemnation or sin consciousness, just deal with it quickly. If you've sinned, confess it, receive forgiveness, and forget it. Okay, because he'll bring everything up to you. But usually he brings up condemnation. And, you know, uh, conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Condemnation comes from the devil. Conviction is very specific and there's a feel about it. And, you know, if you deal with it, it'll be good and you'll be free and you'll be clear. Condemnation, there's no way out. It takes you down. When condemnation begins to arise, um, just reject it and deal with it. Cast it away from you. Okay? Deal with that. Don't deal with the devil in waiting upon God. Okay? Don't even think about him. Don't think about spirits, demons, anything else. You've come to focus and wait upon God. Okay, so dealing with your wandering mind can be one of the greatest problems you face in becoming still. And it takes time to control this. You have to constantly refocus your mind. You know, the human brain can only think one thought at a time. That's, that's, a, that's a fact. And so if you change your thought, just rethink. You change your thought, um, you know, just refocus and uh, change the thought. Change your thoughts, your focus, set your eyes and your heart upon the Lord again. When thoughts, you know, arise out of things that you have to do, sometimes the only way to deal with that is to write them down because your mind will not let them go until you've deal, dealt with it. Things that you have to do tomorrow, just write them down. It might take just a few minutes. Your mind will bring something else up, write it down. In the end, it's going to run out of things that you have to do. Your mind will run out, and that will be quiet in that area. But trying to, you know, trying to say, you know, I don't want to think about that. It's, it's, you've got to do something about that. You've got to appease the mind. Write it down. The mind knows you've written that down, and it'll stop bringing it up. Okay? Uh, it, see, this is something you have to learn, and it, it's not easy when you first start. But the rewards are fantastic if you can really learn how to meditate on God. And so, write down, dismiss them from now. Your mind will eventually run out of my, reminding you of things that you have to do. And it will take time to become still. You have to work at it, and uh, you have to get it right. It's not going to happen overnight, but you have to work with it over a period of time, and you must persevere. Okay? Now, if your mind is not very disciplined, it's going to take time for your mind to come become still. And it's, it, it will take time, and you'll have to keep refocusing, taking hold of those wandering thoughts. You know, some people's minds are just like rabbit tracks. They're all over the place, you know? And uh, you've got to pull it in and refocus. Now... The first time you do this, you're not going to be very successful, okay? It's like the first time you try to ride a bike, okay? How many times did you fall off before you could ride it? Well, it's the same with meditation. You're not going to be successful first time, and you can get frustrated and give up. But those of you who will persevere, the rewards are unbelievable. And uh, in this whole area, you have to also kind of bring yourself into a physical state stillness. You have to deal with physical tension. You know, your body can be a distraction. If you're kneeling or sitting the wrong way, aches and pains and bodily discomfort can be a real distraction. It's, the secret is, is becoming comfortable without going to sleep. Okay, getting it comfortable enough so that your body's not aching or objecting. You're not conscious of your physical body, but not so far gone that you fall asleep. So it's kind of... But you have to get some physical stillness there too. And, uh, you know, there are also, there are certain times of the day that are quieter than others, spiritually and naturally. There are certain times of the day that are quieter than others, and particularly at night or early morning. Now, it's, sometimes it's good to take advantage of that. You know, it speaks of Jesus in Mark one thirty-five. It says, early, in, in the early morning, he rose up a great day, be a great while before daybreak, and went out and departed into a solitary place. And there he prayed. See, even Jesus needed to get alone, away from people, away from noise, into a solitary place, quiet. And uh, you'll find that there are certain times 
even during the night, like 3, 4 in the morning, it gets very, very quiet in the spirit and in the natural. Um, it's, I don't know why it tends to quieten in the spirit, but I guess a lot of people are asleep and not active, and you know, so there's not a lot of stuff generated through those hours. Um, but, you know, you need to kind of, sometimes that can be very, very helpful, okay? I'm going to talk to you about coming into a state of, of, of meditation, but firstly, the use of music can help still you, but there's also some real traps in that. Um, music, in the, in the initial stages of becoming still, you, music can be helpful. You know, um, Elisha in Second Kings 3, 5, he said, bring me a minstrel. And when the minstrel came and began to play, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. When he got quiet, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, 2 Kings 3.15. Music can be a help to quiet in your inner being. Now the New Age are very well, they're very well adapted to that. They know how to do that. Christians don't. Um, music can be a real help in quieting your spirit. However, you need to be discerning as to what kind of music you play. Any music with a strong beat or rhythm will totally throw you out. It's best that the, if you can get music which has virtually hardly got any rhythm. Because what happens is your mind, your physiology, your, your heart it will start to sync with the rhythm. And it'll start to beat with the rhythm. Your whole being will start to do that. And it's anything but quiet on the inside when that begins to happen. Now, music is good, but you've got to be sensitive uh, any music with a strong beat or a strong rhythm. And by the way, that's so in worship. I'm talking about when you get into that very still worship, if people start to clap, you knock it out. So don't do it. You just knock it right, right out of the spirit because it, the, the, the rhythm has got to be so slow that it's hardly perceptible. And um, you, you kind of you know need to understand that it must be slow, uh, very worshipful, must be gentle, it must be quiet, very quiet music. Um, if the music is accompanied by words, particularly words that you know, your mind will lock on to the words and to the voice of the person that is singing and it will take you out. Just You can't do it. It does not work. There is a time for sing-alongs, but it is not trying to become still. Uh, it, 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 will, it will be very unhelpful. Um, and, uh, you know, you can sing very quietly along for a little while with music that is worshipful, quiet, and slow. But, however, eventually it must give way to stillness and, and quietness. So what we're saying here, you, music can be helpful in the background. It is better in the end that you have music that you don't, there is no words to because your mind will keep locking on to the words. Okay. And let me just get rid of all the religious demons. It doesn't have to be Christian music. In fact, there is very little Christian music that doesn't have words to it. So you're going to be very kind of locked out of that scene. But there's lots of good, quiet, beautiful music, which is not Christian music, which you can use. Okay, now don't get, you know, everything has to be Christian. There's some beautiful music written out there by people. It came by inspiration out of the spirit. And uh, creative music, it's very still, it's very quiet. Now, there's some of the new age music, which has no rhythm at all. You've got to be a little sensitive about that and careful about that because some of that stuff has been prayed over and dedicated to things. But try and find music that is in very, very little beat. The beat has to be hardly perceptible, the rhythm. Okay? Let it be quiet. In the background, it'll still you. Um, so it can be helpful. Uh, okay, your emotions. You have to focus your emotions. Um, as you begin to focus on the Lord, channel your emotions in a flow of love towards the Lord. Just love the Lord. Be in his presence. If spontaneity flows, we talked about spontaneity in, in, in some previous studies. If that flows, just listen to it. Okay? Wait, be still, listen. Just keep your, your emotions. Your, your emotions must be focused in love. If you, if you can't do that, you're not going to get in. You have to set your heart 
in your emotions on loving the Lord. That will take you some time to do that and, and kind of focus that and be able to do it. But you need to do that. Now, as you, become, as you progress through this, you know, sometimes it can take you an hour to get still. That's why this is going to take time, but the rewards are great. It can take you a while to get really still in your heart and your mind, your physical body, in the presence of the Lord, just with very, very, very quiet. Don't pray in tongues loudly. Just keep everything extremely quiet. Um, and just, just worship the Lord. Just love the Lord. Now, when you do that, when you become still, a change takes place um, within you. Um, you know, some of the research being done on sleep laboratories are interesting because as it relates to our being quiet uh, within ourselves and becoming still. And what has been discovered is that when you are wide awake, uh, your brainwave levels are very high. And they're called uh, beta level waves. They're very high. And, um, you know, you're alert and you're, you're awake and you're bright and shiny and awake. It's your brain wave levels are fairly high. And um, when you become more relaxed, uh, when you're asleep, or when you become just more relaxed, more into a meditative state, your brain waves slow down quite rapidly, slow down to what they call an alpha level. And this is measurable by physiolo physiology and, and the effect of stilling our cells. There are two other levels below that, theta and delta. When you get down to theta, you're virtually dead. But, you know, theta, you're unconscious. <laughs> um, but the, in meditation, the idea is to drop down into this alpha level. And, um, you know, alpha is, is that realm where meditation begins to take place. I want to explain that to you in, in just a moment. The theta level is the painless level. It can be a trance level. Have you ever seen on TV when those, those guys poke skewers, you know, through their cheeks and out of that, and, the, and there's no pain? They've dropped into this level, this theta level, okay? It's almost a trance state. Their brain waves have slowed down to such a degree, there is no pain. And so it's a painless level. It can be the trance level. And demons can take people into that theta level through trance. That's what happens to those people, Okay? And uh, it's, uh, the delta the level is very, very low, you're unconscious or, or dead, okay? But you see, it has been discovered and measured that when Christians or occultists, doesn't matter, whether you're Christian or occultist, enters true stillness, they enter the alpha level brainwave activity. Everything slows down. And it's also, it's very interesting, it's also been proven, tested, and proven that when a person prays in tongues quietly for a long period of time, they will drop into the alpha level state. If that's just in prayer, praying, not, not with outside activities going on around you, but just, you know, you can pray driving to work. I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about being alone, praying in the spirit for a period of time. You will also drop into that level. And uh, so you see that quietening yourself before God is not just a nebulous thing. You actually enter a different state of being that can be measured. Okay, the brainwave activity can be measured. Now you might say, oh, I just believe in the anointing. That's fine. You won't get very far. You've got to learn how to come into the presence of God and be still before God. There is a a level where you enter into the fourth dimension. That is the realm of God. And uh, you can come into that. And uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. I'm going over here. here. It, might, it might be helpful. Um, okay, we're talking about... Um, okay, let's have a look. These are your brainwave levels up here, measuring 32, AGC or CPS, Okay. This is in the physical world. At that level, your sight, you're wide awake, sight, sound, feel, time. You can feel things, time and space. 
it's the conscious mind, the objective mind, it's at this beta level, okay? Brain waves are very high. Once you drop down to the next level, that's at around about 14, um, the alpha level, you enter into the, what we call the fourth dimension, where time and space, uh, there are no limits in time and space. But it's also been also proven that at that level, at that um, level of meditation where you've dropped down, you've become very, very still and quiet, you have maximum brain energy and learning level. Okay? This can be experienced while you're asleep or when you are off your while awake. Dream levels occur in these two levels here, the theta and the alpha. Okay? It's the uh, subconscious level, subjective mind. Uh, if you drop down to the theta, your brain waves are down to about 7 EGC. That's where there's painless surgery. The occult use it for the ex uh, to get, do things which doesn't cause pain. If you come down to the delta level, you're dead. Uh, we're almost dead. Your unconscious level, you come down to, to, to naught, which is just three below that, you are dead. Okay, so these are the brainwave rhythms. True meditation is in the alpha state. Okay? So, very important. How many of you know in this state, any loud music, any loud rhythm, any loud noise is going to pull you back right up to here? And you become alert again. Now, you know, some people might have trouble with this and think, you know, well, it's, um, you know, we know the New Age people do that. It's, um, you know, you see, how many of you heard of Nostradamus? Nostradamus got into this state here. Now, Nostradamus was an occultist, okay? But he got into this, he, get, he could easily get into this state here where there's no time or space limits. Okay, maximum brain energy, learning, but it's quiet. Still, there's no time or space limits. So could, he could view in this realm things that were far into the future because there's no time or space. Everything exists at one level. And so he could, in this level here, he could experience and understand the realm of eternity where there is no time. That's where occultists can dwell. That's where Christians should be when they're meditating. Now, everything that the occultists do, the Christians have got, <gasps> Christians mustn't do it, okay? No, we should be doing it, they shouldn't be doing it, okay? Everything they do is a counterfeit of the real thing. So let's get, kind of get thrown with what the New Age do. But, you know, forget it. Christians should learn to move in this realm here, come into this state, okay? And uh, it's... it's uh, an important thing that we have to learn. Now, so quietening yourself before God is not just a nebulous thing. Sometimes also to help slow you down, quiet your step down, you can control your breathing and deliberately keep your breathing down to a very slow rhythm. That will help you come down. You have to, you have to, to kind of uh, concentrate on that for a while until your breathing, your whole rhythm is down lower. When that happens, um, it also helps your whole being to come down um, a little lower too. Now, what happens in that alpha state of stillness? One, we've said no time or space limits. You can see future events. This is known as the fourth dimension. It's in the dream, vision, uh, level, you know? And uh, your dream and visionary capacities are heightened. Your spirit awareness is heightened. Uh, that's the meditation state. You see, we've been taught just, you know, get on the scriptures and think about them, meditate on them. That's really not meditation. It's kind of thinking about the scriptures. Meditation comes down to another level, okay, um, which you can't, you know, God says be still and know, but you cannot know until you're still. Now, this is kind of important. As we said before, you know, when you are still, you enter another state of awareness. Now, speaking in tongues can, also, can help you with this. You know, Isaiah 28, 11 says, For with stammering lips in another tongue, he will speak to his people, to whom he said, This will be a rest to you. It will bring you into rest. And it will cause the weary to rest. 
Now Paul in the New Testament quotes that scripture in 1 Corinthians 14.21 and he also talks about the example of speaking in tongues which will bring you into a state of rest. However, if you speak in strong tongues, it will do just the opposite. It has to be there are a place for strong tongues. You know, I have taught on that. There's a place for that. But this, we taught in my meditation. Everything has to be very quiet, slow, still, and gentle. If it is not, you'll be pulled out back up into the beta level where you're just wide awake and conscious. Now, it's so understanding that, you know, it can bring you into rest. Psalm 4, four and verse 4 says, Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed. See, commune with your own heart upon your bed. Talking about meditation. The art of becoming still yet focused is very difficult to learn, but you can learn it. You can learn to come into this. Now, very quickly, let's just look at meditation on scriptures. Okay. Now, to do this, now, there are a number of ways in which you can read the scripture, okay, and, and which are valid, all are valid. You know, you can come and you can just take the scripture wherever you're reading. You can begin to quietly read the scripture and God can speak to you. That's fine and that's wonderful. But we're talking about to a, a quite a different level here in meditating on the scriptures. Okay, you can read the scriptures and we should do that. It will give us insight and some level of understanding in the things of God. But there is another level which you is, is attained, which you come to um, when you come to the scriptures with meditation. So first, you must become still. Now, the state of stillness is recognizable. You know when, it's, when you are still. It's, it's, it's hard to describe because there are degrees of stillness. But when you've reached a degree of stillness, you will, you will know it. And some of the recognizable conditions are um, you will have one of physical calm. You will have a focused attention. Distractions have ceased. There's a state of letting go. Driving is stopped. You are focused. You are receptive. And there's a feel about it. You know when your stillness has come. Now, once you have reached a certain level of stillness, you can begin to meditate on a particular scripture or incident in scripture, quietly asking the Lord about it. But you're still in that, that level of stillness before the Lord. Let me give you an example. You may be meditating on Adam in the Garden of Eden and quietly asking a question about it. If you just quietly read it in that meditative state, you're still, you're calm, you're quiet, you read it, you ask the Lord about it, and you need to wait. You just meditate on it. You muse it in that quietness, that still, you muse on it. You know, you meditate on a particular scene from Scripture. And let God take you into it. Remember, when you enter this level here, a meditation, if you get quiet enough to enter this, this level, everything slowed down, there's no time or space limits. Now, because it's the realm of eternity, it is the fourth dimension, it's heavenly places, it's the spirit. Now, as you kind of meditate, just, just let God take you into it. You can actually step into that realm. You know, this is very, very hard to explain. There's a scripture in, in the book of Ecclesiastes that says that everything has been is now, and everything that is to come is now. And he was talking about the fourth dimension, past, present, and future being one. Now, Einstein understood that, and it was a correct theory. Um, and the realm, the fourth dimension, you enter into that dimension, past, present, and future became one. That's how Nostradamus could see events that were yet to take place a thousand years down the way. And he was an occultist. He entered into that realm. Christians can enter into it. Occultists can enter into it. It's neutral. It's a neutral realm. Now, when you enter into that, you know, you go and you begin to muse and begin to meditate... God can take you into that scene in the Garden of Eden and you can 
actually see and watch what it was really like. Now you're looking at me a little kind of strange. I was in this uh, town, in, 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 I was in this, this town in, 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 in northern New Zealand, and I was in a hotel room praying because we were trying to start a ch church in this town. Nobody would be able to start a successful church in this town. It was in the north of New Zealand. And I was in a hotel room praying. I got very still and I got very quiet. And I was asking the Lord, saying, Lord, what is it about this town? And I was just meditating upon the Lord. I was thinking a lot about it. I, was, I became extremely still. And my, and my whole being became very still. And I was just quietly asking the Lord, why is... And it was just like there was a transition took place. And I found myself walking down the streets of this town. But the problem was... It was 200 years prior to the time that I was in. And I was walking down this street. The streets were different. The layout of the town was similar. I was walking down this street, and I looked, and the river running through the town was red. And I said to this person, this Maori man walked up, and I said to him, why is the, why is the river red? And he said, because of all the cannibalism that's taken place over the last month. And I thought, my goodness. And I, suddenly I was pulled out of it. I don't know what I did, but I lost it. And so I began to pray some more about this. And I began to do some research. And that town, a town by the name of Wangare, was, was particularly bad um, for um, cannibalism. <laughs> Not just Maoris against Maoris, but Maoris against Europeans and the whole thing. And that whole thing had to be dealt with. Okay? Now, so what we did, what we did, we called the Maori elders, Christian Maori elders together in that city. And it took a while to little organize it. We called them together. We called together some European leaders. We had a time of reconciliation. We had a time of forgiveness. We had a time of repentance. We had a time of dealing with the problem which was the blood which was still crying from that city. And uh, after we got that thoroughly dealt with, God began to move, church was established, which is still flourishing today. Now how did I get into that? I came into that through a meditative state where past, present, and future becomes one, and you can see events of the past or the future. Another time I was preaching in a church at a place called Curry Curry, which where they were having way up north in New Zealand, where they were having major problems. And and I said to the guy who was pastoring, I said, look, let's just have a prayer meeting tonight. Because I preached a few nights and it was really hard. And I said, why don't we just have a prayer meeting tonight? As we were praying, I began to get quiet. I told the people to keep it very quiet. But just, I got to get really quiet in my spirit. And I was saying, Lord, you know, what is this? What is this? What is this? And I began to see, as I began to get still and quiet, I began to step into a scene that God wanted to show me. And it was the weirdest thing you can imagine. I saw this Maori warrior in a suit of armor. And I looked at this, and I thought, God, what is this? And a suit of armor. Now, this is not like the revelationary prophetic arm. It's another realm. Okay, so I was watching this guy, and he was fighting in this suit of armor. And it was also, and then, then that scene changed, and I could see this guy cutting a flagpole down. And I could see the British put it back up, and he cut the flagpole down again. And I thought, this is so weird. Anyway, we closed the meeting. I went home, went back to where I was staying in, the, in that town. And I said, Leo, what is, tell me about the history, the past of this. I said, you know, I keep seeing this guy, and he's married. He shouldn't have a suit of armor on. That's British. Where? <sighs> One of these guys by the name of Honey Hickey used to go into battle in a suit of armor which they, he had got from a British establishment which they had raided. Can you imagine this? And then literally he used to go. Not only that, there's a whole legend, not legend, but reality about him cutting a British flagpole down. And I thought, my goodness, this is real. You know, this, 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 this is real. We have to deal with this. We have to get something right here. And it took time to get the thing right and get the thing sorted out and the bitterness 
against the British and all that kind of stuff. When that was sorted out, church began to flourish. Now you say, well, you know, what are those things? See, meditation can cause you to step into that realm. And you can be meditating on any portion of scripture and God can take you into it so you can see exactly how it was. Now, you see, we don't have this taught very often because people always labor at the cultish. And we really have got to stop doing that. We, we really have to put an end to this. This is a genuine, all of the Old Testament prophets moved in this realm. They all moved in it. John the Apostle saw people, you know, John on the Isle of Patmos, in his time saw people that had not yet been born. In the book of Revelation. Now, how could he do that? By entering that fourth dimension where time, past, present, and future are one. You see, in this whole meditative realm, you know, is, is very, very important. It's a very powerful thing, you know. God can teach you many things through meditation. That's why David said, I have more understanding than all my teachers because I meditate in the things of God. And that gave him insight and understanding which the others didn't have. You see, you can do this, and the same thing, you know, applies to meditating on the Lord. You can use the same approach. Meditate on the Lord. Begin to experience Him. You can use the, thing, the same thing of meditating on a word. For instance, use the word grace. You get, but you get into a state of quietness and stillness until everything has come down and you are very, very still. And that's why, let me just say something, that's why sometimes God, the easiest time for God to speak to you is just when you're falling asleep. You're not dead, dead in sleep, you're not fully awake, but in that twilight time, you notice how many times God will speak to you. You might dream something or see something. That's because you've entered the alpha state. You're not right into the theater, you're not fully asleep, you're, not, you're in that state. God speaks to you in that realm. Sometimes that's the only time he can speak to us. And, um, you know, you meditating on a word, for instance, take the word grace, you know, you meditate on it, muse upon it, think about it, the grace, the grace of God, the grace, meditate on, think about it, be quiet, be still, ask the Lord to let you show you what that word means, you'll find that God will take you into it, so that your understanding of it will be way beyond your ability to learn you'll begin to understand that in that realm because your learning capacity is so heightened at that point in, in, in the spiritual that you can really begin to understand it. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's a wonderful thing. Many times when I am studying, and if I get still in studying, and uh, I, I, I just get real still, but I am studying, Suddenly the Lord will just take me into things and just show me that. Might last just a few minutes and then some outside noise or something will take me out of it. But I was there long enough to grasp and understand some things. It's like an anointing which comes upon me. It's like a, a stillness settles into your heart. You become very still. You enter that alpha state. Quietness, stillness. Your brainwave levels have become very low. You're just in the presence of the Lord. Quite often studying, that happens to me. It just takes me into it. I can't explain it more than that. But when that happens, you know what you know, what you know is right. You just, there's a, another dimension. You're, 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 you're entering into an understanding from the things of God, you know? There is a prophetic experience, experience which is higher than the normal prophetic anointing, which takes you into this realm. It's a state in which you walk through the prophetic word and actually can interact with it. But, you know, that's a different thing. There is an anointing which takes you into that. Um, we're not, that doesn't necessarily come through meditation. But some people who become very proficient at the prophetic can actually enter into and interact with, walk into the prophetic word and interact with it. You find that the Old Testament prophets did that. They actually interacted with it. And, but today we, deal, you know, we are dealing with meditation which gives you an inroad into this realm. See, there are far greater realms of the spirit for you to enter into. Much greater than you've touched. 
There is much, much more that God has got for you. And because the church has been so afraid of this, fear holds people back. And fear, fear locks people out of the way, the realms that God wants people to walk in and move in. Man, and, 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 you know, these realms are reserved for the hungry, the determined, people who wish to walk with God as God intended us to walk with him and tend to have heaven on earth, days of heaven upon earth as we walk in both realms at the same time. See, how did Rick join and write those books in the Alpha State? He was awake most of the time. Some of them he dreamed, but most of the times he was awake when he wrote those last two books. But he was in an Alpha State where he could interact with people in the realm of the Spirit. Now, you know... I don't want you to go out here and say, you know, this is weird stuff, because it is not. And it's God has another level and dimension for you to enter into. And you can enter into it. But the problem is, <laughs> the problem is you've got to get still. And this whole kind of lifestyle we live prohibits us getting still. So you, if you really want to, you know, begin to experience this, you have to begin to organize parts of your life where you can be still. There's no phones. There's no children. You say, oh, I'll never do this. I've got young kids. There are times when they're asleep. Particularly during the night. Depends how hungry you are for reality. You've got to organize your life your home, your circumstances where there can be stillness. And if you can get it there, then go out into the bush, go out somewhere, sit quietly, take in the scenery, let your spirit begin to get quiet, let it come down, and use that. Eventually you're going to have to close your eyes because the scenery will be a distraction. But it can start to bring you down, get quiet, get very still. It just takes a voice from somewhere to drag you out of that state. It'll, if it's loud enough, it'll come through. If the telephone rings, you're shot. Pull the plug out. The sun will still rise tomorrow. The world will still go on if you pull the plug out on the phone. Okay? Get very still in the presence of God. But I want to tell you, what I'm teaching you today is a key. If you are going to go further in God, it is a key to your advancement in the Lord and in the things of the Spirit. And you will be locked out of it to the degree that you don't enter into this. Be still in order to know God. But it's very difficult. And it's going to take some discipline on your part. See, when I, you know, when I teach this, and honestly, I don't, I've only te- taught this twice before because it's, you get so much reactions from it. But, you know, when I teach this, there'll only be a handful of people out of the whole congregation I teach it to, the whole lot of people I teach it to, there'll only be a handful who will end up doing it because it's too hard for a lot of people. It requires too much discipline, too much organizing the circumstances, and you can't do it in five minutes. So you've got to have at least a couple of hours up your sleeve. Be still and quiet. But if you will do it, and you know, you will get discouraged when you start to do this. You'll get discouraged with your mind. You'll, then you'll begin to understand how wayward your mind is. You'll get discouraged with your ability to focus. Most people cannot focus beyond one minute. Most people, a quarter of a minute, they can hold a focus. You try it without anything and any other thought about what, except what you're focusing upon. For instance, you just focus upon the Lord and think about Jesus or a word like grace or something else. Say how long you can hold that. If you're good, you might go half a minute. If you're very good, you might go a minute. And then you'll find that there's some other thought has crept in. (laughs) Very subtly. And you've got to refocus again. But if you work at this, 
you'll become very skilled at it and you'll quiet yourself reasonably quickly. It just takes time. It's like I said, riding a bike. You're going to fall off a lot of times before you learn to ride it. Have you ever tried to ice skate for the first time? Okay. You're going to fall over a lot of times before you get it right. When you come to meditate, you're going to fall off, fall off the plot a lot of times until you get it, start to get it right. But if you are determined and you keep and you are persistent, you will begin to get it right. Our minds are so busy. They are so... Um, they are so... Uh, well, we live in a state of tension all the time. Demands upon us. And somewhere down the line, we've got to start streamlining our lives and we say enough is enough. Start trimming back. We can learn from others. A lot of the middle, middle-aged mystic Catholics, some of those priests really knew how to meditate. Now, don't get kind of thrown by Catholics, okay? Catholics love God, all right? You know, they might have some doctrines which are off, but probably so do we. So, you know, they love God. And there were some people back there who really knew how to meditate, you know? Just, they knew how to come into stillness. They knew how to meditate. And it's very, very interesting that most of them who got through into that realm were either burned to the stake as Catholics, not as Protestants, or they were walled up in prison and left there for life. Now what, you wonder, why is that? Because they, they got onto keys, which were the keys of knowing God. And all of, most of their works were burnt. Possession of some of these books was death penalty, mandate, mandatory death penalty. I've got one of their books, one of the books, and it was death penalty for the, anyone who was found th with this book in the Middle Ages. Catholic Church was so afraid of it. These guys, see, we can learn from a lot of things in the past, people who have been this road before. But you see, there is a way in to this dimension and, and into this realm. If you can become still enough, quiet enough, till you drop down into that alpha state, you'll begin to reach into the realm of God. You know, the cultists do this and they're focusing on spirits, demons and spirit guides and that's where they go. Christians do this because their focus is the Lord. That's where they go. What you focus on, you connect with. But the pathways are neutral. Many of the pathways into the realm of the spirit are neutral. They can be entered by a cultist or they can be entered by Christians. And meditation is one of them. There are many, many things which we do which occultists do. Many. They just do them better than us. Because they're more dedicated. Okay. And so, not being... We've got to get rid of fear of that realm. Fear will lock you out of it. You know, and stop you moving into it. Your heart and focus is the Lord. That's what you get. You know, the disciples, when he was talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in Luke chapter 11, he said to them, look, he said, you're asking for the Holy Spirit. He's not going to give you a serpent. He's not going to give you a stone. He's going to give you the Holy Spirit. What you focus upon is what you get. So you don't be afraid of that realm. Just keep your focus clean and pure. That's all. And it will take you into that, that whole area of the, of the spirit realm. And when you become really practiced at this, you can drop into it very, very quickly. But that will take time. And you're going to, in starting this, you're going to feel very discouraged because it's going to be very difficult for you to do. You know, you'll almost feel like, oh, it's too hard. Give up. Keep going. God is at the end of this. Keep going. The rewards are great. You'll finally get it if you keep going. You'll learn how to still yourself and come into his presence. It's a very subjective thing. It's very hard to teach. It's so subjective. It's, but you will learn the way in. And when you learn that and you start to do that daily, your life will totally change. Your work with God will totally change. 
your whole life will be revolutionized. Okay, I don't know if I can say much more, but will you do it? Are you convinced enough to do it? That's the question. Okay, there is a way into that next level of relationship with the Lord. You think, well, it was only kept for special people and mystics and so on. No, it wasn't. It was kept for you and me. Says the fool, even the wayfaring man can find his way in. Not difficult to know the way. You just have to do it. Hallelujah. But it will change your life. It will change you forever. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you'll just take, Lord, these words of truth today and impact your people with them to such a degree, Lord, that there'll be a hunger and a thirst, Lord, created within their hearts and minds to, to, to go down this path, to search for you with all of their heart, to seek you until they find you in this, this dimension, this realm, this level of relationship with you. Lord, just give them a holy dissatisfaction with where they are and what they have because there is much, much yet more to come. God has much, much, much more for us. And he wants to walk with us in a way which years ago we would have thought was totally impossible. But today we see it's not. God wants to walk with you in the realm of the Spirit. He wants to interact with you this way. He wants to teach you of his ways so that you might really know how to come before him and come to know him. He wants to show you, like the Holy Spirit said, he will show us things to come. He'll take us into that dimension of this realm of the Spirit. I pray, Father, today in Jesus' name that upon some here today will settle the conviction upon them, will settle upon them the conviction that God is no respecter of persons that each one of us can find our way into that walk like Adam had with you in the beginning, that we can walk with you in the Spirit. We, we can be seated with you in heavenly places, the realm of the Spirit. We can interact with you in that realm. We can find a way in to another level beyond just this status quo Pentecostal experience. We can go further in our relationship and our walk with you. Father, I just ask you that upon some here today will settle the, upon them the conviction that they can do this. And with that, there'll come a determination to, to structure their lives, to be able to do it, to be able to spend the time and give the time. Because, Lord, the rewards are great. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Well, the ball's in your court. To do or not to do. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you for coming. I will go with you.